until somebody comes in. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cram and Kirk here to begin our service. I invite you to stand as we carry the Bible into the sanctuary. If you're able, please stand with me. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each one of us. Good morning and welcome to Cram and Kirk. It's very good to see you in church and for those viewing from home, we have a warm welcome to the Avis family who have come for a scattering of ashes after the service. We hope you all enjoy this time of worship. The announcements are printed. Um, for people at home, you can't see them, so I'm going to draw attention to two or three. We're having a retiral offering because we care about what's happening in the troubled parts of the world, and this is through Christian aid, but supporting those in Turkey and Syria affected by the terrible earthquake there. Kirk Session is meeting this week, Thursday at 7.30. There's a visiting team coffee morning that's going to be in Brunsfield Golf Club and please speak to Kathleen Malone if you're interested in that. Um, we have, we're looking for live stream volunteers. We have over a hundred people watch the service from home each week and occasionally we have a real difficulty providing live stream. It would be good if we could have one or two more people in our team next Sunday after the service Graham Maidley will give some instructions so that you would be able to cover this. I hope two or three people can help us in that way. The flowers are from the Willis family and there's a big intimation about the jumble sale, giving lots and lots of details. It's an important social event and an important fundraising event and we hope you can join in with that. Two more things, our prayer diary is available today. Some excellent prayers written by the Johnson family. We invite you to use that. And the Grapevine magazine, because we care for our community, has been prepared with new editors and that will be distributed right around the community now. So please have a look at that if you don't get one on the regular delivery. These are all the notices. 
We're going to worship God and virtually everything comes up on the screen. The psalm today is psalm number two and Claire is going to help us with the responses. Claire, let us worship God together. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Let us continue to worship God by singing him 122. Let all the world in every corner sing, my God and King, him 122. Let us approach God with confidence. Let us pray together. Please be seated. Lord, we have left our homes and have gathered here in this place familiar to many of us at an early time set in our weekly calendars. We come to thank you that we are here to meet with you afresh in a new way. May this gathering today be a time and a space when we find a moment in and out of time, a moment to meet with you when the daily veil that at times covers our lives is removed and we can see your glory. Glory revealed in the beauty of the universe you have created. Glory revealed in the beauty of human lives well lived. Beauty revealed in this Kraman community in so many ways. Most of all, beauty revealed in the love of your Son, Jesus. Help us today to come to meet with you in a new way a way that helps us to glimpse how things really are when we come into your closer presence. When we allow your light to transform us and the world around us, Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, we bring our prayers. Amen. Boys and girls, sometimes there are extraordinary things happen that we cannot 
fully explain. They happen in all kinds of strange places and at strange times. I wonder if I'd asked the children what a carrot looks like, you would be able to tell me quite easily that a carrot is orange in color and it tends to have this shape. That's because they go into the ground. But when my wife went on her shopping this week, I think it was to Sainsbury's, but I'm never quite sure, she discovered a carrot like this. Can you see that? It is a carrot that's a semicircle and it's connected and it's very small. I don't think there's a lot of eating in this carrot, but I had never seen a carrot like it. And in a sense, that is the message for today. We're going to look for something that we've never seen before or have seen before and never properly perceived it. I'm going to ask you to take part in a little game, something you used to do at the rainbows and cubs and brownies. I'm going to ask you to do an action with me. We're not going to put anybody out, but I would really like it if you could all do this. And it, there is a purpose to it, and I'm only going to do it once or twice. I remember in Sri Lanka, I was asked to take a scout service. There was over 300 scouts who didn't all have great English, and I had to do this, do this, and they had to do it, and do that, and they didn't have to do it. And it was confusing because they couldn't all get the words, but you can get the words. So when I say do this, I want you to do it. Do this. And when I say do that, you don't do it. So you should be doing this. <laughs> so do this, do that. You see, anybody who puts their hands out would be out the game. But I just thought, <laughs> let's do this. Let's do a, a strange kind of semaphore sign. Now, I'm not going to, but if I was going to take a photograph of Cram and Kirk and put it on the website and ask people, what on earth do you think is happening there? It's like candid camera, beetles about all these TV programs where something very strange happens and we get a shot of that. And I think the story of Jesus on the mountaintop is rather like that. It is not easy to understand. You're going to hear it in the reading. You're going to hear Peter's words about it in the other reading, and I'm going to speak about it later. But I want to give you a clue, a clue. There's a difference between a puzzle and a mystery. If you have a complicated puzzle, solitaire, even a Rubik's Cube, it is a puzzle. And there's a way, if you go on YouTube and you take enough time, you can solve the puzzle. A mystery is something much different from that. A genuine mystery invites you to go into it, and as you go into it, deeper and deeper, you get a deeper understanding of the mystery. One of the great German thinkers said that God is three things. God is tremendous, and God is mysterious, and God is awesome. And today, you're going to get a little taste of that in the sermon. So, for the children, it is not a puzzle in Christianity. It is a mystery. And it has produced this story because it's about light and Jesus shining brightly on the mountaintop with three friends has produced some marvelous hymns. And if you feel like moving your arms about, you'll be welcome to do so as we sing, shine, Jesus, shine. It comes from this story and you'll find the words at hymn 448. They'll also come up on the screen.
Let us hear the word of God. The first reading is taken from the New Testament, St. Peter's second letter, chapter 1, and reading from verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly despised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. <coughs> so we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. <coughs> First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Amen. The second reading is taken from the New Testament, St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, and reading from verse 1. 
Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. <clears throat> he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, my beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome with fear. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. May God bless to us the reading and hearing of his holy word, and to his name be all glory and praise. Amen. Hymn writers have responded to this powerful story in a variety of ways. Carol Daw in his hymn suggests, Bright the cloud and bright the glory, brighter far than mere sun's rays, opening up a glimpse of heaven on disciples' awestruck gaze. Power past their comprehension, splendor too profound for praise, always changed, always changed. They would never be the same. Let us sing that hymn now. It's hymn 353. <laughs> And the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, 
our rock and our redeemer. Stand-up comics who were anti-Christians could have an absolute field day with this story. You saw what Billy Connolly did with the crucifixion scene. They would have a field day with this one. A mountaintop encounter, a radiant Jesus, three dumbfounded disciples, a shining cloud, Moses and Elijah present, and an awesome voice from heaven. What really happened? Was it a vision? What went on up there on that mountain? It's the kind of question that secular citizens in the world of the 21st century would ask. They would like us to be there with TV cameras recording a mob of reporters. They would travel across the world for an interview with Peter, James and John. It would be aired on News at 10, live interviews. What did you see? What did you hear? What did you feel? That would not be all, of course. Then there would be many explanations, columnists, social media, people who spend their lives spinning theories, psychiatrists, physicists, theologians, astrologers, research buffs, philosophers, mediums, UFO researchers, and New Age fanatics. It would all end with, have you got, have you got news for you? I've got the wrong title there. <laughs> Have I got news for you? I've written down. Yes, Ian Hislop would be there making smart comments and stand-up comics would add it to their act. They would have an angle. They would have a go. They would take the story down and show that it didn't make sense to them. But I am not a stand-up comic. And this is not a theatre for laughs. We're in church and I want to argue with you that you too have been transfixed. You have been transfixed. Transfixed means to become motionless with horror, wonder, or astonishment. Transfixed and transfigured are, of course, very close. In the list of the greatest films of all time, often the film that's top of the list is called The Shawshank Redemption. It's a prison film set in a prison. And there's a vital moment in that film. Stephen King, who is the author of the book and who wrote the script, is a Christian. And he has the scene where one of the inmates has built up his reputation and his trust with the staff and he's able to get access to the library and he starts to lend out books. He creates cultural awareness within the prison setting and then he gets access to the music. And so one day he's in the central office where the PA system is and he locks the warder into the toilet and he finds a copy of The Marriage of Figaro, written by Mozart, as the choir sang today, a Mozart piece. And he puts it on through the sound system and then he realizes he can put this through the PA system and it will affect everybody in the prison, all the warders and all the prisoners. Some of you have seen that film and you know what happens. The music comes on and every prisoner stops, transfixed, and then they turn gradually round to look at the speakers where the sound is coming from and they can't move. Morgan Freeman is another inmate and he provides the voice over narration. He says, I've no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. Truth is, I don't want to know. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words. 
and it makes your heart ache because of it. I know it gave everyone who heard it in this prison a sense of freedom. One piece of music. You too have been stopped, stunned by the beauty and power of a new life. Can you remember the first time that somebody handed to you a newborn baby? Not necessarily your own, just a newborn baby. That is stunning. And with a baby crying in the background to <laughs> emphasize it. You are suddenly the most powerful person on the planet compared to the baby, but you're overawed by the vulnerability of the infant. A baby, any baby, newborn. The story we heard today is that kind of story. Three people are transfixed, and it does have a context, and it does have a meaning. It's a story about unveiling God amongst us. It's about seeing the light of Christ in the face of Jesus himself. That's why the church observes on this day the transfiguration. It's the end of a period of study. We call it epiphany. It begins with the wise men taking a long, long journey to look into the face of a newborn baby and to bring their gifts. And now we have three disciples climbing up a mountain taken by their Lord, and they have an epiphany. They see the light of God displayed in the whole being of Jesus, and from that moment they become wiser. And the story works for us too if we approach it in the right way, not as a puzzle, not as a stand-up comedy routine, routine, but as an opportunity to glimpse the glory of God. You may have seen it at the top of a mountain. You may have seen it by a lake. You may have felt it in a quality of love you share with a parent, a brother and sister, a spouse, a partner. The love which flows from a valid epiphany is the vital thing. And the love which comes after being transfixed is really the test of whether this is an engagement with God. What should happen is that we are filled with love and we want to share that love with others. Peter, James, and John saw the truth of their master Jesus on that mountaintop. They saw something that none of them would have predicted. They didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to do, but they were changed. They were transfixed and then changed and transformed to the end of their days. They didn't stop talking about Jesus. They didn't stop living it out. They were all killed for what they believed but they believed and they continue to talk about that story, which is why we have it today. So at the end of the service, as you look back on those special moments of love and recognition and being transfixed in wonder and astonishment, I want you to think about them and how you can use them to continue to inform and change your life. They were validated by a quality of love for God and for one's fellows. It was to prove very costly. The cost was enormous, but none of them would have had it any other way. Once we have glimpsed the transfigured Christ, as you see in these hymns and as you heard in the reading, you will realize that moving into a mystery is more satisfying than any puzzle. I'm going to close with Peter's words. He was there. This is what he said to reporters and to you and I. 
we were eyewitnesses to His majesty when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice came to Him from the radiant cloud, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We actually heard His voice from heaven. We were with Jesus there on the mountain. I give thanks today that He continued to share that story with others. May we be transfixed and transformed and as generous as He was. Let's listen as Simon helps us to reflect on these readings. And now let us bring our time and our talents and our money forward as we stand and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let's stand together. of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Please be seated. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the world you have made, for its wonderful landscapes, its changing seasons, and its teeming life, for the life you have given us, for the treasures of art and science and the variety of human goodness. For the gift of your Son, our Saviour, born a child, growing to maturity, teaching your truth, 
healing the sick, befriending sinners, crucified at Calvary, risen, ascended, and with us forever. Lord, from our hearts, we thank you. For all you offer us through Christ, for the leading and strengthening of the Spirit, for our baptism and growing in faith, for the nourishment of word and sacrament, for the fellowship of others in the church right across the world. Lord, from our hearts, we thank you. Stir up in us, loving God, the desire and the determination to glorify you in every prayer and in all our relationships. Transfigure not only our own lives, but also the lives and affairs of the millions with whom we share this planet. Transfigure each ordinary church goer. Dispel discouragement and self-doubt, self-righteousness and arrogance. Transfigure the women and men who preach the gospel. Enlarge their understanding and expand their capacity to share, to love. Transfigure the hopes of the downtrodden and dispossessed. Give a new compassion to the strong and the prosperous. Transfigure the expectations of the young. Disperse the indulgence with which this society indoctrinates them. Transfigure the values and goals of political leaders in Scotland and everywhere. Inspire them to act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Transfigure the anguish of those who tremble or weep or suffer or die today. Let the valley of sorrows become an avenue of hope to your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who prays with us as we say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. I finished with a Charles Wesley hymn, which I think summarizes where we want to go with this story, that individual Christians and believers are not supposed to have a warmer, loving relationship or a better understanding of the light of Christ. We're supposed to see that we are being changed till in heaven we take our place, till we are lost in wonder, love, and praise. It's all about love, love divine, all loves excelling. Let's sing together hymn 519.
now, having received love, to give it generously with those we meet, those near and those as far as Turkey and Syria. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon us this day and remain with us forevermore.